It's the greatest thing in the world to be a Christian. We will never regret, I will tell you, we will never regret becoming a Christian. Days can be difficult. Life can be very, very challenging. But even up to that point where we take our last breath on this earth, no matter what are the conditions, we'll never lose out on eternal life. That's a long time. The challenges in this life are temporal. I mean, they will not last. Sometimes when we're going through challenges, they feel like they will not, you know, we're not going to get through them. Sometimes God doesn't get us on the other side of those challenges, but God helps us in the midst of those challenges. But the good thing to know is that, as Romans 8 tells us, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. This morning, I'm glad you're here. We are in our final lesson of our series for 1 Peter. I will be in chapter 5 this morning. I'm going to begin by reading a prayer. This particular prayer is probably one that some of you have heard in times past. So let me just share these words as you open up there to 1 Peter chapter 5 in your Bible. The prayer reads this way. Lord, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper, I haven't been greedy or grumpy or nasty or selfish or overindulgent. I'm very thankful for that. But in a few minutes, I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm going to need a lot of help. We all need help. We need help from God every single day. We have challenging times, and I say more than challenging times in our lives, and certainly some of our brothers and sisters across this country and around the world are really undergoing severe trials. We all have days that we especially need some help. I came across this little story about a police officer in a small town who stopped a motorist who was speeding down the main street. The officer walked up to the vehicle and said, Sir, you you were speeding, you're going to get a ticket. The man says, "Uh, Officer, I can explain. He said, Be quiet, you're getting a ticket. Officer, I can explain. He says, Once more, be quiet, you're getting a ticket. And he says, If you say another word, I'm going to take you down to the jailhouse. But officer, I can explain. All right, that's it. We're going to the jailhouse. You're going to you're going to sit there until the chief gets back. Anyway, about an hour later, he walked back, the officer walked back to the holding cell there and so it's a good thing that the chief is going to be in a good mood when he gets back because he's at his daughter's wedding. Now the man said in the cell, he said, well, don't count on it because I'm the groom. <laughs> and I was trying to get to the wedding on time. Both of these men were having a, a bad day, but they're not the only ones, of course, who experience you know, difficult days, challenges. We can attest to that. In fact, we know as believers that Satan is always trying to get us to have a bad day. He's always trying to to ruin our relationship with our Lord, and and we have to be on our uh, alert. We have to have our antenna up, our spiritual antenna up. And that's what this little section about here in in chapter 5. I think one of the most familiar verses in chapter 5 is verse 8. Scripture reads... And this is Peter writing to the church there, going through manifold trials, by the way, back in chapter 1. He said they were going through manifold trials, various trials, various kinds, and great difficulties. He says, be self-controlled. I'm reading the NIV here, the New International Version. He says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan is actively trying to get us to have a bad day every day as far as our relationship with God is concerned. Peter wants us to understand as believers that we need to be alert. Our adversary is dangerous. He is trouble. Uh, don't, Don't be foolish. Be aware. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 I think says, Don't be unaware of his schemes. We know that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. You know, he tries to disguise, you know, the attack. But he is one who can be overcome through the strength of our Lord Jesus and through prayer. The devil is likened to a hungry lion in 1 Peter 5. 
who can devour us when we least suspect it unless we are watchful. We have to be alert. And so when temptation comes and trials invade us and, and attack us and we're in that arena of pressure to give in to trial, we need to be on our utmost attention. We need to give our utmost attention to God's Word, to the power of the Word, to the, the strength that the Holy Spirit gives us, and to the importance of prayer in our battle against temptation. Be on the lookout, I would say, for the escape route when temptation comes. Be on the lookout for the way out of yielding to temptation when we are tempted. And there is a way out. We need to rely on the strength that we have talked about in times past in Ephesians chapter 6 as we put on that armor of God that helps us to stand firm against the devil's attacks. We know that our shield of faith can distinguish, extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, or arrows. And so as we look at uh, the way out, and we have to be alert to that way out, we have to take that way out, because we know there is one. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 tells us there is. The Bible says, No temptation has seized us as what is common to man. God is faithful. Well, we, can, we can depend on God. That's, that's one thing we can always do, is depend on God. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, and we will be tempted, all are tempted, when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Now the verse prior to verse 8 says, Cast your anxiety on God because He cares for you. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? Well, we know God is good. And we know God is faithful. We know God loves us. But just the, the idea of absorbing for a moment the, the reality that God cares about us, cares about you when you're going through these trials. And not only does He care, but He says, I want you to do something for me. I want you to cast your anxiety on me. You know, that's pretty good news. He cares that much. I mean, it's great to be in a church, in a family where we know each other, get to know each other, we can help each other, we can encourage one another. That's wonderful. But the fact that God cares, the fact that God cares in those pressing minutes and those pressing hours of temptation and trial, that He wants us to cast our weight, filled hearts of anxiety on Him, it's really good news. God cares. And I love those two words, don't you? God cares. Peter understands that these Christians are going through some very, very difficult days. And he says God wants you to understand that, that He wants your anxiety. Just toss it on Him. And, and Peter tells us why. Because God cares. Now, as I think about the, the battle of temptation and not yielding temptation, I, I, I think this is a, a pretty accurate statement. Anyone who does not pray is likely to become prey. You know, we don't have to, you know, when we're tempted, we don't have to call time out because Satan doesn't give us a time out. But we can pray. And uh, I know it goes against some of, uh, of our learning when we were young. We can pray with our eyes open. We can pray we're being attacked. We can pray when the temptation is really pressing down upon us and the challenging, challenging days or the, or the pressures are there. We can pray. We can pray as we... Look, we can pray as we're running from the temptation. Um... Potiphar's wife was getting pretty, pretty close to, to Joseph, and, and he runs. He probably was praying as he ran, but at least he, he knew what to do. He got away from that temptation. He resisted temptation, and that's what this section is really about. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the background. I've touched on it a little bit in our series. Let me tell you a little bit more about what is about to happen. Um, it's already being, these Christians are already being persecuted, but it's going to be turned up a little bit. Peter knows it by the whole, way of the Holy Spirit. 
These Christians were already suffering persecution at the hand of the emperor of Rome, named Nero, very evil man. They were dealing with manifold trials already, because we see that in chapter 1. And according to reliable history, the Roman emperor, emperor Nero will soon burn Rome, a, a big section of Rome, and blame Christians for it. Nero had building plans, according to history, to, to redo, give a facelift to a large section of, of Rome that wasn't so attractive. And the people living there did not want him to do that because they were going to, <clears throat> they were going to have to, you know, put forth a lot of money to help in that facelift. And they were very ple uh, pleased and content with where they were and how things were. But Nero wasn't content with that. And Nero took things in his own hands, and according to history, on July 19, AD 64, the great fire of Rome broke out, and it burned for three days and three nights. And finally, momentarily, they got the fire under control, but, but then, then it took off again and burned an even larger section of Rome. And the powerful individuals, very powerful individuals in Rome, knew Nero was to blame. And to try to cover his tracks, this is, this is pretty reliable history here. It's not Bible, it's history. But it puts it in the context of what's going on with the biblical history. To try to cover his tracks, he blamed Christians. And, and they used, he used Christians as a scapegoat. And in this intense measure of trying to persecute Christians and take the, take the light off of them, he didn't have anything personally against Christians. He just was a scapegoat. And he used them. And he persecuted them intensely. And he had, as I mentioned a few weeks back, he had his soldiers sew animal skins on some Christians that he had arrested. And then he threw them out to the lions, literally, for entertainment for the people. This was one of the ways in which Nero was persecuting the Christians in his day. And, and I think, and I hear that, and we hear about other stories in our world in, in difficult times and difficult individuals going through standing up for God and standing strong in the faith and yet, you know, suffering great, great persecution. It makes our days, our difficult days, look a little bit more, hmm, I guess it puts it in perspective, I'd say. Peter says in chapter 5, verse 13, that it, he's... He is writing from Rome. They give you greetings. She who is in Babylon, the church, is writing from... Well, they are writing from Rome, but he says Babylon. You notice that? Babylon of old was, was ruthless in persecuting believers. He doesn't even want to identify where he is because Babylon was a code word for Rome, for the Christians. Peter's main purpose behind his letter was to show these Christians... They could depend on God's grace through all kinds of sufferings and trials. 1 Peter 5.12 says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand in it. We don't have to guess what Peter's purpose was for writing this letter. He wants them to know the true, the reliable grace of God. That grace would help them to stand up under Satan's pressures, the pressures they were feeling. It would help them to stand up and not compromise their faith. And we have a responsibility in that. We have a responsibility to stand up. God gives us the tools. We have to make a choice. Peter says we need to be self-controlled <clears throat> and alert. The idea of being self-controlled is, is self-restrained. That's pretty self-explanatory, but that's what it is. Be self-restrained. In the word alert, word the King James, some other translations say vigilant. The idea there is to give instant attention it requires that when you're in that zone of temptation. It requires that when you're being attacked by Satan against that spiritual enemy. Why do we have to be self-controlled? We know. Why do we have to be alert? Because our enemy prowls around. 
We know that. And we don't have any doubt here who our enemy is. The devil. The devil prowls around. So we're not left to wonder who that is. And that idea of prowling around indicates the restless energy of which Satan is roaming around, trying to capture, to bring into his clutches, uh, to make, make our spiritual life with the Lord destructive. He wants to destroy our faith. What did this John 10 verse 10 say? He's a thief. He wants to steal. He wants to kill and destroy. And all that has to do with our relationship with God. Okay. Then we have the word roaring. Okay. That's, that's an amazing thought when you think about being attacked. Certainly on the idea of a lion. The roaring lion. The idea of warring is used of wild beasts when they are on the prowl for their prey. The roaring doesn't happen while they're hunting. Because that might scare off some of their prey. I might give them a little more warning. The war comes when they have cornered their prey or have caught their prey and they let out a war celebrating their catch. For all the jungle or wherever to hear. The word devour literally means to swallow down. It implies destruction. At this time, the Christians were hearing the war of frightful persecutions. And in a sense, <clears throat> it was the war of the lion. And Peter warns us to walk with our eyes and our ears. Eyes open and our ears alert to danger. Years ago, Hollywood took a fellow by the name of Johnny Weisman, or some of you who are older remember. Johnny Weisman, he was an Olympic champion, swimming champion. And they, they took that man and they made him a Tarzan. The black and white movies uh, were pretty, pretty interesting to watch. I remember watching a lot of those shows. The plot was always the same, wasn't it? Pretty much. They would take a group of people <clears throat> from America or some other place, and they would transport them to the deep parts of jun the jungles. And they would always be you know, maybe on a search for a hunting uh, expedition, or maybe they were on a search for lost persons, or maybe on a, a search for a lost treasure. But in any case, they were deep in the jungle, and it's obvious they were strangers there. Peter has talked about being strangers. He's talked about being aliens in this letter, and how we need to be alert. That group would walk through the hostile jungle full of snakes and spiders and elephants and lions and alligators. In every part of the movie there, that, that show, there were some unfriendly natives. They were looking to hurt the group. And as you watch the show, they were always looking, always watching for danger. At night, they would have a big fire, you know, like a bonfire. And there would be people that would have fire watch. And they would keep the fire going because it seemed like if the fire ever went out, nothing good's going to happen. Nothing good happened when the fire went out. So they would take shifts. They stayed very close together because there was strength and unity. They helped each other. They encouraged each other. At times they walked hand in hand. At other times, they walk uh, with their hands on a rope as they walk across the creeks or, or walk across the swamps or, or, or around the corner or over the hill. They had, they had a connection to each other because they were stronger together. We draw together in the church by God's design. Not only to praise God, but to help each other, to help each other stay alert to our enemy. We get strength and we get encouragement from one another, but God provides us the ability and the strength to live godly in a hostile world, or as I said it last week, to stand upright in an upside-down world. We, verse 9, it says, resist him. That word resist is the same word that's found over in James 4, verse 7, when he says resist the devil. The idea is we're to resist the devil because it is the idea of which we can stand with that unwavering resistance and oppose the attack God's way. We stand firm, stand firm or steadfast 
first nine, implying solidity, uh, rock-like firmness. We know we, we really got our feet planted, and we come together. And it says that we our resistance is connected, I believe, by the scripture to the phrase in the faith, the faith. It's not a personal faith there. We have to have personal faith, obviously. But we have to have personal faith in the faith. And that's the faith that many of the priests in Acts chapter 6 verse 8 became obedient to. The faith is something that we can read in the Scripture, we can understand in the Scripture, and we can obey uh, the teachings of Christ. That's what we're talking about. And then after, uh, as Peter closes out his letter, he, he touches in verse 10 about that grace that he's touched on early, a little later there, verse 12. Trust in the grace of the one who called you, uh, called us to salvation. That's important. Scripture says the God, I love this, isn't it? The God of not just grace, but all grace. He says the God of all grace, who has called us to the eternal glory in Christ, after you suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, Oh, that's pretty cool. He will make you strong. And the phrase, after you suffer for a little while, has to do probably with the degree, but it also probably has to do with the duration of the, of the sufferings, reminding us that our sufferings are temporary and compared, and compared to eternity. I mean, they're not going, you're not going to suffer forever. There is a time. Our glory is eternal. We will rejoice with the Lord forever. And right now we experience pain at times. We experience suffering, various kinds of trials. We find at times people look down at us because of our faith. We find other times because we, we follow Christ or people will mock us and maybe do maybe things that are worse than, than just simply saying bad things. But it was not last forever, Peter says. We have this promise. Will himself restore us? What a promise. The idea and the word restore means to mend that which is broken. It's used in Mark chapter 1, verse 19, to, to the mending of nets. But it's also a word that was meant to bring back that which was broken like a fracture, like an arm or leg fracture to bring it back into place. He himself will restore you. What's our part in this? In summary, to be self-controlled and alert, resist the devil, standing firm in the faith, casting our anxiety upon him, and holding on or trusting in the grace of God. No matter what we're going through, God's grace can save us, it supports us, it strengthens us. There's an old story about a man who died and went to the, quote, pearly gates. St. Peter told him that they were going to review his life and if he, if it all added up to a thousand points, he'd get to go into to heaven. Man said, okay, that's good. He felt pretty comfortable with that. And so he said, well, he said, uh, I taught Sunday school for 40 years. And uh, just about every Sunday I was there. And Peter says, one point. And the man said, well, a little surprised by that, but the man said, well, I was a faithful and loving husband. He says, okay, two points. He says, I was a nurturing and dedicated father. Okay, three points. The man was becoming concerned at this point. He said, well, I gave a tenth of my income. Peter said, okay, that's worth another point. After the man had gone through a number of other things, he came up to where he had 12 points. And the man finally said, I give up. The only way a person is going to get in here is by the grace of God. Peter, St. Peter said, that's... That's worth a thousand points. <laughs> we all need the grace of God. Peter says, I've written you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. When you are suffering, you need to be reminded of the grace of God. And how the grace can help you to stand. And how we can stand fast in it. The power to live faithful and endure onslaughts of the devil is ultimately tied to the grace of God. The true, the valuable, the reliable grace of God. Some of the difficult situations we deal with in our lives kind of nip at our heels. There are other situations that kind of grab at our throats. 
I don't know what you're going through right now or what you're dealing with, but we all have trials of various kinds. And one by one, as we go through these trials, they present themselves, we need to make the spiritual decision to cast them in God's direction. Because His grace will support us. His grace will sustain us. His grace will strengthen us. And of course, His grace saves us. Are you willing to place your faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior? I know many of you have, but if you have not done that, or if you have done that and you have not been baptized, immersed into Christ, where we can know and you can know by Scripture that you are in Christ, where you have the strength of Christ working in your favor and you have been in contact with the grace of God that saves, this morning will help you to do that by being immersed in the Jesus if you repent of your sins. If we can help you in a public way, please come as we stand and sing.